All right. Lecture number one of International Monetary Economics by J.T. Harvey. Okay, I got contending perspectives completely done. I haven't even started this one, and it's a, uh, let's see, it's the Friday before the week from Monday will be classes, so I've got, what, like nine days, it's ten days? Yeah. Okay, but here we are, COVID times. Okay, international monetary economics, what is it about? I'm not sure, let me find out. Uh, oh, that's right, exchange rates and capital flows. Uh, I'm terribly sorry the dog is bothering me. He brought a toy in. Uh, well, bring it here. Uh, exchange rates and capital flows. Uh, and one of the things I always try to point out about this class, I'm going to stand up and grab the toy and throw it. Um, the, well, now he's walking away. Um, the, uh, you know, the finance department version of a class on exchange rates, ha, is going to tell you how to go about, you know, um, uh, Oh, good Lord, what's the word? Um, hedging against uh, various exchange rate movements and so forth. Uh, how to run your business. That's not what we do in economics. That's why we're not in the business school. We're in the College of Liberal Arts because we're concerned about policy. So we're going to figure out what is it that drives exchange rates, and the answer is going to be financial capital flows, uh, and does it do so in a way that is advantageous to those of us who are in those economies? In other words, we're worried about the social welfare, uh, as we always are in economics classes. Ultimately, when we get to the end, we want to talk about policy. Uh, here's the way it works is what we usually spend most of the class on. And then we get to, okay, should it work that way? All right, so we're, we're going to have to decide whether or not at the end of the course, uh, this is a good way for the international monetary system to be organized. All right. Well, several years ago, I done written me a paper on uh, how you are supposed to teach, uh, which class was it? Uh, intermediate macro, intermediate macro, which by the way is a prerequisite for this course. And in doing the background research for that paper, I discovered uh, in the pedagogical literature reference to something called remember to know goals. And remember to know goals are, you know, well, what are the things you hope students carry away with them after the semester's over? Because they're not going to remember all the details. I didn't. Uh, I can remember I took a year of Russian. And on the day of the final exam, I remember thinking to myself, this is the most Russian I will know for the rest of my life. Uh, and I was absolutely right on that. Uh, I can count to five now, and that's about it. So uh, what was it that the, uh, there's a piece of wire inside his toy, but I think he picked that up somewhere else. Um, probably not from, from China. Uh, and um, the, uh, yeah, so at, at any rate, sorry, I, I'm stuck alone today because Melanie had to go into school, and so I'm having to entertain both the dog and uh, do these uh, videos. Uh, and I'm gonna have to pick something up and put it right in front of the wire for the camera because he thinks it's fun to leap over that wire on his way to get the um, toy that I throw. And at some point, he's going to hit the wire and pull the camera down, and the camera was expensive and stuff like that. All right, uh, so what are my remember to know goals? Well, I, here's the funny thing. I'm writing this paper, right? Uh, and I'm saying in the paper, and you ought to have remember to know goals. Uh, I, I didn't. Um, and so uh, the next opportunity I got, he's torn up a mask. Uh, the next opportunity I got, um, I sat down and wrote uh, remember to know goals for every class. And again, these are the things that, you know, you're not going to remember the details, but what is it that I hope you carry away with you, uh, you know, 10 years down the road, you don't even remember where you learned it. Uh, but this is something that you have, in fact, it's no longer, it's, it's remember to know. The idea is you remembered it for the exam, but then later you just kind of know it and you're not even sure where you learned it. Uh, and, and, and that really is a big factor uh, that we at least subconsciously think about. And now I consciously think about because I read that article. So here are my four remember to know goals. And these are in rough order of importance. Like, you know, if you remember nothing else, I wish you remembered this one. If you remember two things, I wish you also remember this one. And on down the road like that. Very first thing is going to be currency prices are a function of financial capital flows. Boy, if you don't remember that after this class, then uh, demand your money back. That's what you should do. Demand your money back uh, because that's going to be over and over and over. The idea that exchange rates, that currency prices are driven by international financial capital flows. All right. Uh, second, 
The movement of those international financial capital flows are a function of agents' forecasts of short-term capital gain. In other words, what, dry, what, what causes financial capital to move around the world, thereby changing exchange rates, is going to be the forecast of those who are making the purchases of international financial cap capital. So it's going to depend heavily on, on forecasts of short-term capital gain. Third thing, those forecasts are unstable and focus primarily on psychological and behavioral factors, which we will go over, I think, before exam one, because I've reorganized the class a little bit a couple years ago. And then fourth and last, under current conditions, there is no reason to expect exchange rates or financial capital flows to move in a manner that improves the welfare of the citizens in the economies in question. In other words, when we get around to policy, we're going to say, yeah, it didn't work that well. We ought to have a different uh, way to organize the international financial system. Okay. So let me go over here some things, and what I'm going to do here with these lectures, uh, and these are these lectures are being made in COVID times. Although I might well use them uh, if we all survive to another year uh, during other semesters too, if somebody needs some you know backup uh, uh, from from the lecture. And so, uh, but right now this is for COVID times, and. Uh, the, I'm going to go over what the way I used to teach the class, and hopefully will teach the class again one day, is from a list of study questions, which which basically represent my um, uh, my lecture notes, and I'm going to go over these in order, and then one day when it's normal again, I'll actually you'll you'll know oh he's going over the study questions is what he's doing, but right now I'm just kind of going over uh, my lecture notes is what I, what I shall call them, uh, and the very first study question I have in every single course except econometrics is for the student to learn how to distinguish between validity and cogency. Okay, validity and cogency. And these are properties of an argument, all right? An argument is a series of premises that lead to a conclusion. Premise one, uh, let's see. Here's the one I used in containing perspectives when I did those videos earlier. All dogs love chewing pens. He especially likes these right here, which he likes to take up on the couch so that the ink bleeds everywhere. Premise two, Kobel. Oh, sorry, buddy, he looked up. <laughs> Kobel is a dog. Therefore, guess what? Kobel loves to chew on pens, or Kobel loves chewing pens. Um, all right, that's an argument. Let me back up here. I can't tell if it's focusing very well because I don't have my glasses on. Uh, but um, I, I may zoom in just a tad. That's a technical term, by the way. I hope that's out. Okay, stop, stop, stop. All right, there we go. Um, all right, this is an argument. It is a series of premises that lead to a conclusion. Now, validity only requires that the argument, uh, that the premises lead to the conclusion, all right? So, does this logically follow from premises one and two? Uh, I, I would say yes, I certainly intended it to, uh, that it does logically follow from those two premises up there. So this is, an, this is a valid argument, all right? This, this is a valid argument. Uh, and validity is fairly objective. You and I could disagree about all kinds of stuff, about whether or not uh, China developed uh, coronavirus in a lab, uh, about whether or not, uh, I don't want to get too controversial here, but uh, lots of stuff uh, about whether or not they should be playing Major League Baseball right now when teams keep coming uh, coming up with um, uh, in, in, you know outbreaks of, of uh, COVID-19 and so forth. We can disagree about all kinds of stuff, but I think that the vast majority of people who at least understood logic would be like, oh yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, yeah, sure. If that's true and if that's true, then that follows, all right? Uh, and that's validity. Validity is really, in some ways, a mathematical exercise, certainly an exercise in logic. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we economists do so much stuff in math, all right? That we're trying to lay out these premises um, very carefully and specifically. So that we can see, you know, well, uh, what if uh, consumers would prefer to pay less rather than more? 
and what if producers would prefer to earn more rather than less? Let's see if you can see this over here. I believe you can. Quantity, price, supply, demand, Q0, P0. Let's assume, that's a premise, let's assume that people would rather pay less than more for goods and services, and that firms would rather receive more than less, you know, and uh, then if we put those two things together logically, what fun, oh, well then logically, the equilibrium price and quantity in this market would be P sub zero and Q sub zero. There's our conclusion. Our conclusion is the P sub zero and the Q sub zero, and it's based on the underlying premises in each of those graphs, or in each of those functions, I should say. Uh, so that's why we do a lot of this uh, because now we've laid out and now you can you can uh, the logic is is valid but the question is are the underlying assumptions for the supply curve and demand curve reasonable okay that's the next point cogency uh, are these premises warranted now notice I don't say true um, we never know true all right uh, to, to, to be very very hardcore scientifically um, true to the idea that we should be skeptical as scientists, we should never say true. Uh, so far, the evidence supports the idea that Coble is a dog. We have had no evidence to the contrary. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, we can't say, well, we can because we're pretty dang sure about this one, but we want to be careful when we're talking about more scientific endeavors, you know, that, that uh, well, I don't know that it's true that Coble is a dog. I wouldn't say this around the Thanksgiving dinner table. Uh, you're going to get a lot of funny looks and like, oh my God, what kind of stupid education are we paying for for our child? I'm not sure that Rover is a dog. I mean, all the evidence points that way, but can we ever be sure? That's not the sort of thing that goes over well um, in a uh, uh, mixed company. Uh, so but, but, you know, I think uh, I kind of digress there. Um, and it turns out that I do that whether I have an audience or not, uh, but or a live audience. Uh, and so, uh, but the cogency is all about are these premises warranted? Now, cogency requires two things. It requires validity first, because there's no point in checking the premises of an argument that's stupid to start with. L let, let's say here, um, Coble hates to chew on uh, pens. You'd be like, well, that doesn't even make sense to start with. So I'm, gonna no I'm not going to knock myself out trying to figure out whether or not these are warranted when the whole thing fails before we even start. It's not even valid. So there's no point in checking the uh, cogency of an argument if it's not valid. In fact, you can't because cogency requires validity, but that's why. There's no point in checking this if the argument isn't valid to start with. So cogency requires validity, gotta be, gotta be valid first. And then second, the premises have to be warranted. That's what I said in the book I read to come up with this, uh, but I kind of like reasonable. Does it seem pretty reasonable, given the body of evidence and, and the state of scientific knowledge right now, that Coble's a dog? Yeah, it seems pretty reasonable. Um, what about all dogs love chewing pens? I don't know. I only have the experience of the one dog. Uh, we've had a couple of other dogs, and quite honestly, they weren't that big into chewing pens. So uh, I'm not sure about that one. So while we could certainly say that this argument is valid, I'm not sure it's cogent. There's certainly some questions about this one right here. And notice here that cogency is more subjective. Cogency is more, does that feel right? I, I hate to make it sound that wishy-washy, but, but, but it, it, it's more along those lines to be sure. Uh, does that seem reasonable? Uh, and, you know, um, so that's what uh, validity and cogency are. And, and I bring that up because... I know this isn't containing perspectives. In containing perspectives, we do lots of different schools of thought. Uh, we'll do a little bit of different schools of thought in here, but not so much. But, but this is something important to understand as an economist to start with, because I want you to remember that almost every economic argument you ever see, whether it be from Marx, whether it be from Menger, whether it be from Adam Smith, it's going to be valid, because we're very, very careful about that. Um, the question is whether or not they're cogent. Do the premises make sense? And unfortunately, uh, my experience as an econ major was that you get 
kind of beaten out of you the idea that it's okay to question the premises. Um, part of it, I remember thinking this. What well, doesn't really make sense, but I'm sure someone's already thought of that. Yeah, not necessarily. <laughs> uh, or, um, yeah, okay, I guess I'll assume that. Hey, it's going to be on the test, so I might as well, you know, learn it that way. But we don't spend a lot of time in economics classes saying, uh, as students, saying, well, hang on, Professor so-and-so, what if that's not true? What if that doesn't hold? What if that's not reasonable? Does it change the uh, core lesson of the argument? And sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes an assumption is merely simplifying uh, for example, in Marx, there are workers and there are capitalists. Hey, can somebody be both at the same time, you know, like work at the factory and also own some means of production? Sure, but it just makes the argument more complicated. It doesn't change the conclusion, all right? So there are times when we, we make uh, simplifying assumptions. There are other times when we've made assumptions, for example, because we already knew what we wanted to conclude. Now, now here's a problem. Uh, I should back up and say this first that any economic argument is subject to the criticism that the premises are not realistic. Well, of course they're not, because we're modeling, and modeling means simplifying. The real world is too complicated to, uh, you know, model one-to-one -one scale, and, you know, we have to have a model for Bob down the street and for Jane who lives over in Nebraska. And we, we can't do this. It's too complicated. So we have to simplify. So every economic argument is always subject to the criticism it's not realistic. Yeah, okay. They, none of them are. But that doesn't mean they're not useful. All right? Do they, in their basic form, still point something out like, hey, if you raise the price of a good or service, or let's do this. Hey, if there's a supply shock and the supply con declines, prices are going to go up, quantity is going to go down. That's probably pretty dang useful, all right? In a lot of contexts, that's going to be a very reasonable assumption. When we have a hurricane come in and knock out some oil derricks, guess what? The price of oil is going to go up, all right? So, um, and the quantity sold uh, will go down because there's less oil. So, just because we're simplifying doesn't mean it's not useful, but man, you got to be careful, all right? Uh, because you've, you've got to teach yourself as an economist, uh, including as a student, to be picky and not just take the professor's word for it. And actually, it's some of the most fun stuff. As you work your way through the graduate program, you're like, I never thought about that. You know, it's such and such assumption. If I change that, it changes the meaning of the whole thing. And so I bet it, that doesn't mean that that's bad. What it does mean is you better be sure about that assumption. Notice that this whole thing would fall apart if Coble turned out to be a cat. Uh, and so you like, wow, this is a really important premise right here. If Coble's a cat, uh, then it doesn't work anymore. Uh, we could change this to most and probably. And that's perfectly legal. We can say most and probably. Uh, and, you know, so we can ease up on this assumption a little bit and still come to the same, it can still come to a similar conclusion at any rate. But we, we screw up on this one, and it turns out that Coble's a cat. Whole thing falls apart. Does that mean it's a bad argument? No, it means you better be sure he's a dog. All right, you better have a lot of evidence that he's a dog. You better be certain about that premise because that premise is key. Without that premise, the whole thing falls apart. All right. So, uh, I'm going to bring that up now and then throughout the semester when we talk about uh, economic arguments, and by which I mean models and theories. Those are arguments. They're all a series of premises that lead to a conclusion. And please, feel free throughout the semester to say, well, what if that's not true? What kind of alternate assumptions could we have in there, and would they change the outcome? And sometimes they will, which means that assumption better be warranted, and sometimes they won't. It's like, oh, okay, well, you still come to the same conclusion, but it takes you six more steps. All right, uh, that's the first, uh, first question. Uh, and let me show you what the definition is, if you're curious. I'm going to stand over here like this so I can see what's on the screen. I got there, I'm about to go over the next one. I got there, an argument is valid if the conclusion is supported by the premises. An argument is cogent if it is valid and the premises are warranted. 
Okay, uh, and you know, you can obviously pause the video and jot that down for yourself. Uh, also, by the way, you can watch these videos at high speed. Uh, you don't have to sit there and be one-to-one -one, uh, in terms of, of the uh, chronological passage of time with John Harvey. In fact, it's a lot more fun to watch me at, say, 1.75 speed. I sound really funny. Uh, I know, because that's what I've done when I've reviewed my lectures. But uh, 1.5 speed is probably pretty good to be able to... Uh, oh, and turn on the closed captioning, because... Uh, YouTube will automatically close caption everything. It won't be exactly right, especially on technical terms, but it helps a lot. Ah, all right, good drink of water there. Brand new filter in the refrigerator. Okay, let's see what we got here next. All right, uh, here are some background definitions that you need before you start off in a class on exchange rates. And the very first thing, other than the validity and cogency thing, the very first thing I always like to do is talk about the balance of payments accounts. This is going to be very important for the rest of the semester. The balance of payments accounts is how we keep track of, how, uh, of the transactions between countries, how we record the transactions between countries. For example, imports is one of the ways we keep track of anything we buy from another country, we call that an import, and we put that in a certain column. Anything we sell to another country, we call that an export, and we put that down in a certain column. So that's what this is going to be. It's going to be um, how we record the transactions that we carry out with other countries. And balance of payments accounts. Who I was going to look up to see. Uh, we got these um, marker boards from, you know, Ecom was in a trailer uh, on campus, a temporary trailer, temporarily for a decade. And uh, when they tore the trailer down, they allowed us to keep our whiteboards, if we wanted them, in our chairs, which is what I'm in right now. Uh, and so I kept my whiteboard, but somebody got scratched up here. And uh, I, uh, Melanie actually said, Melanie's in charge of our finances. Uh, she said, if you want to buy another one, go ahead. But I thought, well, wait a minute, maybe there's something you can buy to just kind of paint on there to fix that. But I don't know if, that, if you can see that real well or not. I can't, looking at the... I don't even have my glasses on, I can see that. Um, but uh, uh, I may have to, uh, maybe, perhaps as these, these videos go on, you will see it magically repair itself because I will have bought something. Shut up, Jan. Okay. All right. On the balance of payments accounts, there's three major categories. Current account, capital account, and official account. I'm going to write them out like this. And perhaps I shall write underneath in blue. I wonder where the dog went. Exports, imports. Let's see if there's a better blue pen. Yes, there is. Unilateral trans. First. Okay, and I'm going to write something to the right of each of those in just a second. And then we're going to have capital account. I just had an idea. You know what I should have done? Check this out. All right, let's see. Let me erase these two right here. And I'm going to write ones that bring money into the country in green. And I'm going to write ones that send money out of the country in red. And this is going to stay blue because it could do either one. Cool. All right. And now we've got, uh, under this one, capital inflows. Oh, crap. I've left the air conditioner on this whole time. I hope... Well, uh, when I checked last time, it didn't make much difference. Uh, so I'm 23 minutes in. I think I'm going to keep pushing on this and then go back and look. Uh, but on a video I did earlier, it made a big difference. And I had to go download something called Audacity and pull out all the air conditioner sound, which worked quite well, actually. So if I have to do that again, I will. But it's time consuming. Capital inflows. capital outflows and uh, I'm going to write a little bit out to the right of each of those two and then the last category is official account and that's going to be in blue 
government intervention in eh, currency market. Uh, maybe I'll number these here. You don't have to, but I usually don't in class, but just to kind of outline those three big categories. All right, the current account is all about goods and services. Um, this one's financial assets. All right, so maybe I'll do this. Goods and services. Financial assets and of course government. All right. Uh, when we sell a good or service to another country, it's an export. And, and I'm not going to put a definition out there for that because I'm pretty confident that you know what an export is. When we buy a good or service from another country, it is of course an import. And so money leaves the country, but we get cool stuff. Uh, we get cool stuff like this. Doesn't come from China, I'm pretty sure. What do these markers pens say on them? These marker pens say USA, so they must have come from America. Um, what was it with this? Uh, it didn't say. All right. Uh, so, and then unilateral transfers, one direction, right? Ooh. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to bring that up. Um, but one direction, uh, unilateral. Uh, so this is like if the U.S. gives some F-16s, or, or actually no, more more along the lines of private sector. Uh, if the Baptist Church. Um, uh, with good heart but a poor sense of geography gives a bunch of blankets to, pe to poor people in Kenya. Um, and so actually, I, maybe it gets cold at night in Africa. I don't know. Uh, but um, this could be either direction. This was something we sent off, uh, well, you know, we can get, donate some money to some group or something like that. We didn't expect anything back. These are two directional. Uh, goods and services went out, money came in. Money went out, goods and services came in. We just gave stuff to somebody, all right? It's, a, it's not gonna be a big number. I'm never gonna talk about it again, but uh, I include it first run through just to show it up there. I, there was a professor at TCU years ago um, that loved the balance of payments, went into great detail on it. That's not me. Uh, I, I have a strong reason for wanting to make sure you know these four right here. Uh, but other than that, I really don't, you know, th th this is not something that I find interesting in and of itself. So anyway, I, I mention that because I do find it kind of interesting. Uh, when I first learned about it, I was like, oh yeah, uh, but uh, that's the end of that. All right, now I'm going to have to write a little bit of a definition out here. Capital inflow, obviously since it's green, it's going to be a plus sign. And let me write a definition out here. Sales of domestic assets to foreigners. Sales of domestic Assets. Uh-oh. Am I running out of space there? Well, I am. I'll just do this. E-I-G-N-E-R-S. Furners, as my West Virginia relatives would say. Um, and let's see here. Outflows. It's a minus sign. Those are purchases of foreign assets. Purchases of, here I'll even spell it the West Virginia style, fern assets. My mother was born in England and grew up there. And uh, when she came to West Virginia with my dad in 1961, hey, she was a little shocked. Um, where my dad was born, there's a town of about 10 houses nearby, but he wasn't born. He was born at the house out on the creek. Uh, and so she had no idea that such poverty existed in the developed world. It was, a, as I say, a bit of a shock. But the only reason I mention this is because one of my great-grandmother once said to my mother, um, you speak real good English for a foreigner. So, yeah, I'm from England. English, England. My mother didn't say that. She just said thank you because it was a really nice woman. Um, she was also the one who said to my mother, she forgot she was a foreigner. She was worried about all these boys going off to Europe and coming back with these foreign brides. Uh, and uh, my, my mom was like, yeah. Uh, anyway. All right. So what have we got here? Um, the current account is the U.S., we're going to look at, you know, from the U.S. perspective, um, buying uh, goods and services. And of course, we have a balance here, right? Uh, the the uh, current account balance because uh, we're going to have a positive or negative number in total. And you, you know probably that right now it's a negative number, that we have a trade deficit of about a half a trillion dollars. About a half a trillion, which is not really that big, by the way, relative to the overall side of the economy. Uh, 
Uh, but about a half a trillion dollars. Um, all these together, if you add them all together it, with this as a negative number, this is the current account balance. But if you just add these two, that's the trade balance. Now, in practice, people will use those interchangeably, and honestly, it really doesn't make much difference because this is not a big, important number right here. But technically, this is the current account balance, and this is the trade balance, right? Uh, but, um, and, and, and from now on, I, I will use these interchangeably because I don't really care about that, other than to point out to you at this early stage that there is a difference. The current account balance is all of them. The trade balance is just that. There's also a merchandise trade balance that leaves out the services. Uh, and I don't know that that's as popular as it used to be. It used to be a really important indicator, but services have become such a big deal today that uh, I don't know that they really use that independently as much as they used to. You'd have to ask Dr. Sawyer. Here's all the people we have on campus that love international trade. Uh, Dr. Sawyer, Dr. Toshkov, or Dr. Um, uh, Bista. They all like trade theory. Uh, I like trade theory well enough to, to make one of my two specializations in grad school, international economics, but I like the financial stuff. All right, so, uh, and that would be, uh, the other person who's into that would be uh, Dr. Um, uh, Nikar, uh, our uh, newest professor. Uh, in fact, he's going to teach it uh, this time This time next year. No, I think next semester he's going to teach it. Hey, so if you fail this one, you're all set for the next one. All right, and this is, by the way, uh, fall 2020 I'm talking about right now. Okay, um, now we've got capital account and current account. What happens if an American buys a share of uh, a, a German company, um, Krups. I don't even know if Krups exists anymore. Uh, it was a, a big German steel company uh, that was responsible for creating the steel to make stuff like this, although this is plastic. Um, and uh, so if you buy a share of Krups, that's going to show up down here. It's a negative number. Why is it a negative number? Because the money's leaving. Ownership of the financial assets coming in, but the money's leaving, just like an import. The money's leaving, but the ownership of the good or service is coming in. Uh, so, what do my phone? There it is. Uh, the money left the country, but um, the uh, cell phone came into the country. I have a, oh, I think I know what the text is. Uh, and then down here, likewise, for the financial sector, it's the same thing, except. No, oh, no, somebody wanted me to donate money to something. Uh, except that it's the ownership of a financial asset that's coming in. So nothing physical is coming in. It's the ownership of a financial asset. So if I buy a share of stock in another country, uh, if I buy a deposit of, of, of British pounds in a, in a British bank, then that's going to be the same thing down here. I bought an asset, which was some British pounds and a deposit in a bank or a British government treasury uh, bond or whatever. Here's where we're selling our financial assets to foreigners, right? So if we sell a share of Ford to someone who lives in Zimbabwe, then that becomes a capital inflow. Money came in, but the ownership of the asset went out. Isn't it interesting that generally speaking, right or wrong, people's gut feeling about this is positive, but about this is negative. It's okay to sell them our stuff, but not the ownership of our companies. And that this is a negative feeling but hey, we're buying up their company. Yes! Right? And then down here, if the government intervenes in the economy, uh, in, in the exchange market, which they do on occasion, um, you can look up in, I believe it's the Federal Reserve Bank of New York has a section in their monthly periodical uh, saying, what did the Treasury and the Fed do in the currency market last month? And very often it says nothing. We didn't do anything. We just let the currency prices go wherever they wanted to. All right. Now, uh, one of the, so, so, so let's, uh, let's erase most of this and, and give you a summary of it. Hey. Erase most of that and give you a summary. Let's see here. Uh, what was I using for the outline? I was using purple, wasn't I? Well, I don't need that now. Yeah, okay, that's right. That's right. Uh, current account capital account. Let's drop out the government as a relatively minor factor, at least in developed nations. Uh, and here we have exports 
and capital inflows. Uh, and let's subscript these US to be quite clear on what we're talking about. And imports and capital outflows. All right. Oh, oh, oh I forgot the subscript there. And then if you add these together, see if I can get a bit of black pen. Oh, no, I don't think I can. I think that, you know, I went and got a bunch of new pens from the department, and a couple of them died out on me pretty quickly. I think I know why. I stored them like this in a cup. Uh, oh, no, or was it like that? Anyway, you're not supposed to store them vertically. Uh, so it's my fault. I wasted some of your tuition money. See, this is going to be the current account balance. And that's going to be the capital account balance if you add those together um, you know you're probably pretty familiar already with with this you know the US typically has a trade deficit I think 19 I'd have to look it up um, I don't want to guess uh, it, it, it's it's something I cover in another class and I can't remember in this one um, but uh, the US you know has, has had a trade deficit for many years now um, and uh, because this number has been bigger than this number so it's gonna be your negative numbers and your positive numbers so when you add those two together uh, you tend to get negative numbers for the United States and positive numbers for China for example uh, meanwhile the US has consistently had a positive number down here all right and you know why Oh, and I'm, I'm leaving off the government, and I'm leaving off unilateral transfers as being minor factors that would simply complicate our discussion and not illuminate anything. Um, do you know why, what color have I not used here? Blue. Why we've typically had negative on this and positive on that, because whatever number you get here, you have to get the exact opposite number here. If this is negative half a trillion dollars, that one must be positive half a trillion dollars because the two have to add to zero and that's what I need to explain to you now uh, the fact that the two have to add to zero why is it logically true that the two of those have to add to zero hmm I'm thinking about erasing all that and writing this all right yeah I'll do this um, all right I've got three ways to explain to you because all of them are true it just depends on the circumstances which one tends to be dominant but I've got three ways to explain to you why it, whatever number you get up here, you must get the exact opposite number down here such that they add to zero, okay? Uh, and that's going to be something really important to understand as the semester goes on. Why do they have to add to zero? All right, I've, I came up with a couple years ago a list of three items. Here comes item number one. If X US, what have I got here? Less than. MUS. So if we have a trade deficit, if we have a current account deficit, this must be financed by selling U.S. financial assets. This must be financed by selling U.S. financial assets, which would have been that, uh, let's see, maybe I'll jot that down. Um, up here? I want the overall equation for you here somewhere. Oops. XUS. I'm just going to do it this way. Minus MUS is equal to. No, I don't want to do it that way. That's going to be too complicated for you. Let me just jot it down over here. Um, XUS. Oh, I better keep the same colors. Okay, I U S M U S K O U S. Okay, I just wanted to jot down the four items again somewhere so I could ref because you know I just erased it so you can remember what I'm talking about. Capital inflows are the ones that bring in money, but we've sold a financial asset. So if we're coming up short on the first two. on the current account we've got to make up the difference on the capital account um, that's one of the possible reasons if you're a if you're a small developing economy and you are in a situation where you know you're going to end up with a trade deficit with um, an oil exporting country 
they want dollars. All right, so you're going to have to find a way to either borrow dollars from somebody else, which is counts as a capital inflow. What you have sold to someone else is your future earning capacity. When you take out a loan, uh, as many of you have probably already done, you sold your future earning capacity. That was, a, that was a financial asset you had. You sold it to somebody all right, to get cash today. And um, so if you're a small development, develop, uh, developing economy and you're coming up short on the current account, then you need to make some extra money right here. Now you may also be buying someone's financial assets, but net, you need to be making up the difference right here. So uh, if the U.S. is a trade deficit, then this must be, fin I, probably not for the U.S. because people accept dollars around the planet. But uh, as our general example here, one of the three reasons why they have to add to uh, zero is, hey, if you're running the trade deficit, where'd you get the money to do that? All right, where'd you get the money to do it? That's only one possibility, though, of why they end up being equal. And, and it could be some of each in a particular scenario. Here's the second reason why they're going to add to zero. If XUS is greater than MUS, surplus of foreign currency will be used to buy foreign financial assets. Surplus of, and I'm going to put FX, foreign exchange. Surplus of foreign currency, foreign exchange will be used to buy foreign financial assets. Oh, I better put financial in there. At least early in the semester, I want to make sure I'm very careful about that. Um, foreign financial assets. If you end up with some extra um, yen, you could just hold on to those yen, but why the heck would you do that? You're like, oh, well, let's see, I've got some extra yen. I could buy something else Japanese, but I've bought all the Japanese stuff I want. All right, that's why I've got the trade surplus. I bought all the Japanese. So what am I going to do with this? I could put it in my garage. Well, I have a funny story about that. I'll tell that. I'll save that for later, much later. Um, but I could put the yen in my garage, or I could buy a Japanese financial asset and, and at least earn interest. All right. So there's no reason to hold cash because cash is barren. Uh, and so you would at least buy a foreign financial asset of some sort. So if you're generating a positive number over here, you're going to enter into that negative number down there, which is buying foreign financial assets. The red one on the capital flows is buying foreign financial assets. Uh, so if you're generating a positive number on current, you're going to uh, rationally, logically want to generate the negative number on the capital account because that's going to make you some extra money uh, as far as... Um, the uh, yeah, you buy the assets instead of just holding on to the cash. Um, I want to tell you something else about this, and I don't want to forget to say it. So let me jot it down. Let me let me make a note to myself up here. All right, I want to remember to tell you that. Uh, and then last, and one that we're going to be really addressing at the end of this exam one material. If net capital flows. into the USA um, cause a dollar appreciation, then XUS will fall and MUS will rise. And quite honestly, for us, the third one is probably the bigger deal. All right, since there's three, the biggest deal. Um, the first two, you can kind of picture, right? From a sort of a, a, a micro level, um, hey, I'm an individual and I want to buy more than I sold this year in goods and services, which for you would be primarily labor services if it was an individual. Uh, what, what if when you buy your first house? Then you have bought more than you sold this year. You sold your labor services, your salary. And then you bought the new house on top of you know, whatever else you bought over the course of the year. How did you do that? You sold your future earning capacity by getting out a mortgage. All right? So the mortgage is you selling your future earning capacity. Uh, and so that's how you financed it. So that's why if you have a negative right here as an individual, you better have a positive right here. Or you couldn't afford to buy. You couldn't afford to buy what it was that you bought above and beyond your um, uh, salary. Uh, it could have been instead that you were, let's see what we got here. 
I mean, what if you have, well, but I had some stock that I had, so I sold the stock. Okay, well, that's the green one again. You're selling an asset, and that, that's, and that asset for you is usually going to be your future earning capacity, but it could also be, you know, a share of stock or some treasury bills or whatever. You sold financial assets in order to afford, so you, you, you acted on the green down here in order to afford the red up here. All right, so that's the first one. Second one, uh, what if you got a big raise? And it was coronavirus time, and you didn't spend any money. Uh, so you've got this big surplus up here. Well, some of it I'm going to use to buy stuff. Uh, and, you know, but you've already done that. You've bought as much stuff as you want, so you've got money left over this year. What are you going to do with it? Well, you could leave it in the bank, which as an individual you might do. Uh, but let's think in terms of a multinational corporation has some cash left over. Some they may hold as cash for safety. But otherwise, if it's foreign currency, man, I'm just, at the very least, you put that cash in an interest-bearing account. At the very least, you put it in an interest-bearing account where it is, you buy U.S. Treasury bills, which are about that close to cash, all right? And yet they pay a little bit of interest. So uh, it's very unlikely that you would hold just cash if you were an actual company. And then this last one, though, as I said, that's the big one, actually. Think about this. What if the U.S. down here is... Uh, <clears throat> Let's see, I'm going to check my notes here. Yeah, we're selling lots and lots of financial assets to foreigners. This is what happened in the early 1980s, okay? Uh, the U.S. interest rates were really high, which made our financial assets very attractive. And the stock market was, was uh, uh, going up. And so U.S. GDP growth was, was faster than the rest of the world. And so U.S. financial assets were very popular. So without any active you know, um, policies on our part, green was going way up in the US. Well, why did red go up? Just because green went up. Because it made the dollar so expensive. The dollar skyrocketed. All right. So when green is going up, it tends to cause the dollar to become more valuable because everyone's buying the dollar in order to buy those US financial assets, which bids up the dollar. All right. So they're bidding up the dollar by, by buying up these US financial assets, which is what the green one is. Foreigners are buying US financial assets. Makes the dollar so expensive that we can't export anything. But imports are awfully cheap now. Because the dollar is so valuable, the imports are awfully cheap. So the line of causation in the first two is from here to here. Something up here caused something down here. The line of causation in the third one is actually quite common. And it's going to take a graph to show it exactly how it happens. But you, I think you can follow the, the general logic. What's happening down here is causing what's happening up there. Everyone hates our financial assets, so they're dumping all our stocks and so forth, well, the dollar drops like a rock, which makes it easier to export and harder to import because imports become very expensive. So when this number goes down, that number goes up. When this number goes up, that number goes down automatically. All right? And it will. And, and why, why exactly the same amount? We'll have to wait for the graph to see that. All right? That'll be the end of exam one material. But you know, I think you can see in general why if this goes up, that goes down, and if this goes down, that goes up, and you know, vice versa. But why the exact same amount? Well, we'll show that uh, at the end of the semester, or at the end of, of exam one material. All right, and I wanted to remind myself here to say that um, it's not the importer-exporter necessarily who is finding themselves, you know, if you're an importer, uh, let's say you sell, uh, uh, let's see, uh, uh, what kind of car have I got? Kia. Uh, is that from Korea? I'm pretty sure. I can't remember. Well, let's do Nissan. I know that's from Japan. I should know these things. Uh, from Japan. Uh, and so you are a car dealer, and you are buying, um, I, mean, I, I want the surplus here, don't I? Uh, okay, let's say you're Ford, all right? And you're selling cars to Japan in exchange for yen. Well, we, you're not dealing with the yen. The bank is, all right? So really, a lot of these transactions I'm talking about here are taking place at the bank level. The, the actual importer-exporter is just dealing with their own currency, all right? Now, they're having to go through the bank to get the, the, the money translated into another currency, but it's the bank that's dealing with the fact that there's um, a surplus of foreign currency. The bank is going to be accumulating the foreign currency. They will have already paid off the domestic American in dollars, but they've got the surplus of foreign currency, so they're going to be the ones ending up uh, using it to buy financial assets uh, or the multinational or whatever. So a, a lot of these activities here are actually taking place at the financial market level and not at the level of the actual importers and exporters. Okay, uh, and then this has been a long lecture here. That's 49 minutes. I'm going to give you one more thing here, and then I'll stop this particular lesson. 
and I might go eat lunch and see what the heck the dog's up to. Um, floating versus fixed exchange rate system. Floating or flexible. Uh, a flexible, oh, let me show you this. If you want to jot down, you may want to pause the video for a minute and jot this down, but, but here's what I had written down for that whole thing on the uh, balance of payments accounts. So pause your video and write it down. Okay. Um, and now here's what I have on fixed and flexible exchange rates, as you probably just saw. Uh, in a flexible exchange rate system, they just let the market system set the price. Remember I told you that uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of, of New York typically reports that they didn't do anything in terms of, of, of uh, market, currency market intervention? Uh, well, that's a flexible exchange rate or a floating exchange rate. A fixed is when countries fix their currency to another country's currency. As was true from uh, the end of World War II to 1973, all the developed countries had their currencies locked into each other. Uh, and if a currency started to drift away from, it, it wasn't one price, it didn't say, okay, uh, one, uh, let's see, one pound is equal to, Two dollars and fifty cents, and by God, if it moves away from that, one of the governments has to intervene. No, it was like a range. It was like, okay, well, actually, though, uh, it could be as high as say uh, two. You know, I don't know, make something up here: two fifty-five and two forty-five, right? So, so the range. There's a range in a fixed exchange rate system. The governments say, okay, uh, one pound is going to be equal to two fifty, give or take five cents. All right, uh, and the idea is to make international transactions easier for businesses. I mean, C Oklahoma doesn't have a, current, a different currency, all right? So if it did, then if a Texas firm decided to expand into Oklahoma, they're like, oh my God, not only do we have to deal with the fact that Oklahomans are so different than Texans, um, but that we also have to deal with the fact that they got a different currency. And what if it depreciates? What if it depreciates? That's a whole extra worry we've got, right? We're taking that worry away. Uh, there's also some negative side effects, but we'll talk about that later. But what I want to tell you now is that one government or the other, it depends on how they put it together, and we'll talk about this more at the end of the semester, one government or the, uh, or the other is required to intervene if the currency hits or threatens to hit either of these uh, thresholds here. Uh, for example, if one pound is worth $2.55, that's a dollar depreciation. That's a cheap dollar because you're having to give up two, $2.55 to get a pound as, a two, as opposed to 2.45. This is a stronger dollar down here because you have to give up less of a dollar to get a pound. This is a weaker dollar. So if the dollar is falling, then very likely the way they've set this up is the U.S. Treasury Department is required to start buying dollars to stop it from falling any further. That's how they enforce it. That the governments are set up to where, hey, if your currency falls too much, you gotta start buying it. Unfortunately, in order for the US to buy the dollar, they need pounds, all right? So it's possible for a country to simply run out of the foreign currency necessary to defend a uh, exchange rate. And then if it goes down to, if it's really expensive, uh, then the US could sell the dollar. They could buy the pound with the dollar, but generally speaking, they put the burden of adjustment on the country whose currency is depreciating, which is a recipe for disaster, which we'll get to later. But again, uh, that's how a fixed exchange rate works. All right, I'm gonna go eat lunch. Pardon me.